it also makes me think of cocktails. So, you know, you as a distiller, when you forage for when, you know, talking about uh, that, that brandy that, that you um, are planning to make, you're going to have to forage a buttload of those berries in order to make that brandy. It's going to be very labor intensive, but when you're just trying to make cocktails, well, now, if you're just trying to make them for yourself, that just requires maybe a handful or a pinch of something. And even if you do it for a bar, there's a lot of some of the best bar programs in the world actually employ professional foragers to supply ingredients for, for their menu. So I wanted to get your thoughts on using these forage ingredients, not just for spirits, but also for cocktails. What, any, any thoughts on that? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's... I mean, what the, what's the easiest way to elevate a cocktail is, is with a garnish, right? So not only now are you able to forage your garnish, gar forage your garnish, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be quote unquote edible at that point. It could be something pretty. You see, it doesn't, the flavor doesn't have to be what you're going for in that aspect. You're foraging a picture in a sense, you know, you could find, uh, you know, you're making a last word and you find a small little twig that has one, one little leaf left on it. And it's like, oh, it's the last word of the twig or whatever, something silly where you could play those off each other. But then on the other side, you know, having a cocktail program, like you said, you don't have to utilize as much quantity as I would have to in a, in a production standpoint. And people also love one-off stuff that they see on social media and they want to get down there and try because you only have, you're only able to make 50 of them. So let's say you're, you're walking down the woods and you, you know, you come across a, a birch tree and you find a couple young twigs and you grab those and you bring them back in, you boil them and you make a birch simple syrup out of it. Utilize that into, I don't know, whatever you want to do, make a, make a daiquiri with a birch simple syrup instead of a standard simple, simple syrup. See what happens. I don't know what's going to happen. It might be gross, but you know, getting to utilize those flavors in a direct standpoint without wavering them or, or changing them from what they are is awesome, you know, or make some oleosaccharums out of, out of some pine cones, you know, do whatever, do whatever you want to do, but it's just bringing the outside into your glass. Um, it's just a new, it's elevating the cocktail game, I guess you could say, you know, I, I prefer small batch things. I don't really go for the masses of stuff. So if I knew of a cocktail bar that said, Hey, you know, Saturday we sent Jimmy out to X, Y, Z park and he got this, it's going on the menu today. Like he found some black eyed Susans and that's going to be our garnish or, he found wild basil growing over there and star anise seed. And he picked those and he made a, uh, a tea for our non-alcoholic cocktail or something. You know, there's so many options. Um, you just got to try it. I love the non-alcoholic call out there because what those cocktails suffer from most often is this perceived lack of specialness, right? You're taking something out of them. And I've done plenty of NA cocktail content in the past. So anybody who wants to learn more about that can, can check out some of those past episodes, but I don't care. I don't, I don't care how good it can be done. Most of the time they suffer from that lack of specialness. So to add a foraged component to especially an NA cocktail where, you know, you put it next to maybe one of the regular cocktails that doesn't have that forage component. Somehow, like there's somehow we're kind of like, ooh, we're putting everybody on equal standing because we're not, it doesn't have that feeling. It has a feeling that something has been added rather than just subtracted. So I love, I love that call out. And I, you know, when I think of, when I think of cocktail bars, um, I think one of their one of their chief struggles when it comes to differentiation and you know keeping keeping people interested and in coming in to see see what new things they've got is is just struggling to struggling to generate new ideas because if if all you can really do in the cocktail world at this point is riffs on a classic 
which is, you know, it's, it exists for a reason. All the co- we, We've pretty much found out all of the cocktail formats that really work. So we're just riffing on classics now. But if, if all you can do is that riff on a classic, you start to run out of ideas real fast. You can only swap in so many Amaros. You can only swap in, you know, so many base spirits for the other, you know, in an old fashioned. But mm-hmm. when the creative input is the external world when nature gets to sort of dictate of like your creative constraints, suddenly you don't have to sit there, you know, in the the thinker pose and rack your brain for another Oaxacan old fashioned. You can just say, huh, what's it doing outside? Oh, yep. Let's take a, let's go take a walk. Right. When, when a walk in the woods can give you your idea without you having to try for it, a, you just got some exercise and B (laughs) you're, you're doing something inherently more creative than, than the bar next door. So I think for that reason, foraging is, is a really exciting way to get into cocktail development. And, you know, I, I, the last thing I, I want to appreciate about what you were saying is that like, yeah, there's nothing, there's nothing fresher than foraging something and then cooking it right there while you're camping or something like that. And to me, the one, the one group that we've left out so far is home bartenders. And that's that campfire, that fireside thing is exactly what you get when you go out in your backyard, forage something and bring it in the house and literally make it a cocktail out of it right then Absolutely. and there. Absolutely. You know, and I was just thinking on this, you know, one of the easiest things a bar could do with forging is make a saline solution out of salt that's in your area. You know, let's just say the coast of Maine. If you're a bar in the coast of Maine, steal this idea, please. Grab some salt water, dehydrate it down, and make your saline out of, you know, your natural salt and use that in your cocktails. I guarantee you it's going to taste different than using a kosher salt or a pink Himalayan salt or whatever. It's going to be, your customers are going to know it without even being told about it. They're just going to feel it and, and understand it all. But um, even to your home bartender or a cocktail party you're having for friends, like what a cooler way to elevate your cocktail than, you know, not eat, let's, let's even, take foraging out of it in, for a second and say the, the home gardener, because that's foraging in an aspect because you're still fo- you're still foraging that plant. You know, you grew some dahlias and you took those and you froze the, the petals in an ice cube and you put that into there. Or you grew your mint, well, your mint overgrew your garden and you had an excess of it. So you're using that for your mojitos or for your Kentucky Derby party. Like those little things, they... Some people might be like, eh, well, it's not worth it. Like, no one's going to care. Who cares if they don't care? Like, once they, if you care about it, I guarantee you other people are going to care about it. And and feel that just that little bit of extra mile was was put. To me, one of the things that it seems like you're describing right now is a type of grounding. and, And cocktails are, unlike food. We don't need cocktails to survive. Cocktails are inherently frivolous. Spirits are inherently frivolous in a way that like ferments are not, right? Like ferments actually saved us when water was not potable, but spirits are spirits and cocktails are frivolous in a way that food and ferments are not frivolous. And it seems like you're talking about this sort of grounding of the the cocktail experience or the distilled spirits experience by having this reference point that is present and literally of the earth. Like, li- like literally you can point over to that body of water and say salt, or you can point over to, you know, that patch of woods and say birch, right? Like that's a, that's a, or in your backyard when sipping that, you know, Kentucky Derby mint julep say, Oh yeah, I grabbed that mint from right over there. Like that's yeah. a, that's a type of immediacy and grounding that I think a lot of cocktails don't benefit from. So, I mean, personally i'm just i'm i'm really glad that we we were able to have this conversation and throw around these ideas because i think it's just so overlooked um as as a as as a way to add specialness to distilled spirits and cocktails and i'm i'm really glad that that foraging especially right now in the spring when so much is coming alive in in our temperate zones of the world um a great time to have the conversation what are you